Hello everyone, welcome to our presentation. We are very happy to talk to you about uh, this subject today. So uh, multimodal deep learning at scale, uh, learning from catalogs at Miracle. We are uh, Songun Yun and Arthur Delettre, both from Miracle and that data scientists, and we're based in Paris. And uh, unfortunately, our colleague uh, Milton Minervino could not attend, but he contributed a lot to this work. So first of all, who is Miracle? Who is our company? So first, we need to explain what is a marketplace. Basically, a marketplace is a free partite entity where you have a marketplace tenant that sells and manages the marketplace. Then you have a lot of sellers. Those can be brands or individuals or almost anything that sell on the same marketplace. And then you have the customer that buys on the marketplace he sees a unified front, and he can buy uh, all the products he wants. So you can see that this model uh, introduces a lot of complexity, and that's where Miracle comes into play. To give you some uh, examples, some uh, Miracle poor marketplaces are like Kroger, Carrefour, Macy's, Bed, uh, Bed Bath and & Beyond, and we also have a lot of B2B customers, uh, such, are, such as Airbus Helicopters. So here we come. So Miracle is the leader marketplace SaaS platform. And uh, basically, it provides marketplaces with a software that allows them to manage their catalog, their orders, and basically manage everything uh, that has a link to the marketplace. And inside Miracle, our data science team uh, crunches data, develops models, and deploys them mainly as features of the software. We provide a recommendation system, insight model, uh, forecasting across all Miracle scope. This talk, we will talk about first uh, catalog data, what do we have, what we will uh, be able to learn. Then we will introduce two use cases. So the first one will be how do we categorize uh, products with multimodal product embedding, then how do we curate the catalog by removing duplicates, and finally, some key takeaways. So I let the floor to Sangun. Thank you, Arthur. So um, let me start by you know, some giving uh, information about the product data we have. In fact, in Miracle, the catalog is a database containing all products data of the marketplace. And these product data could be uploaded by multiple sellers. And there is a key feature called Miracle Catalog Manager that ensures that everything is represented as a single and reliable catalog. When you look at the catalog, you have the list of categories here. In the screenshots, you see that there is a category named cell phones and smartphones. When you click on that, you can see the list of products. And here, you have some corresponding information about the product data, so product ID, creation date, or so, uh, and uh, you can have also some, some uh, non-mandatory uh, data, such as images here. And this is the, really the catalog, and we want to show you now some key numbers. So in Miracle, we have around 310 million products that are assigned to 140,000 different categories from all across marketplaces. And today, Miracle works with more than 300 marketplaces and 200,000 sellers. So this is a huge number. And we can say that we have a large and diverse source of data. Now, I want to show you the, what kind of data we have in Miracle. So product data may contain some different kind of data. First of all, images, so picture of products. You can have some text, so such as title, description. You can also have some tabular data, the category information, the size, the storage capacity. And here, there is a very important thing. As we work with marketplace, so 
we can have some different product data that are uploaded by multiple sellers for the same product. And when this happens, we need to select the master product data, which is the most complete one. And this master product data will represent the product on the website of the marketplace. Now I want to illustrate this uh, product data with some examples. So here is the first example of the product data. We have an iPhone 13 here. And this is, we, uh, we have the information about the category. So it's cell phones and smartphones. You have the picture of the product. You have the title, the, the description, the color, the dimensions, the screen information, and so on. So this product data is really complete, and it's a good quality. However, for the same product, you can have the product that is uploaded by another seller. So this is the example. You, here you have some problems because this seller uploaded uh, it, uh, you know, this product data, uh, which has some uh, corrupted data or missing data here. First of all, you have the wrong category here, the cell phone cases, that's not true. You have the description in French. You have the wrong color information. You have the missing information about the screen size. You have the weight, which is in non-European metric system. And then you have the stretch capacity, which is very unclear here. So as you can see with these examples, you have some issues. And we have also we observed that uh, there are some recurring issues in our database of product data. So these issues may come from the data quality, so the products with some missing or corrupted data. Also, you can have some sellers that may mislabel information in the product data also. And on the other hand, you, have, you can have some problems of multiple standards, such as different metric systems, different languages, and also heterogeneous category trees. So all these product data issues prevent uh, marketplaces from proposing a reliable catalog. And we needed to focus on two main use cases that Arthur will explain to you. Thank you, Sangun. So let's deep dive into those two use cases. The first one is about product categorization. So let's take a look at a front page of a marketplace. What you can see on the screen is the front end of a marketplace where the customer selected the footwear category. But what you can see is that some products are indeed sweaters. So that's a really big problem because it's a bad UX. So the customer may not have confidence in the catalog. And moreover, those products will be hidden uh, in the sweaters category because they are not in, the, in it. So that was a really good, uh, a really big problem for us. So our first use case will tackle this. It will uh, take data that we have from a product, uh, so the image and the text, and it will predict what should be the category uh, it would be assigned to. So we uh, chose to highlight this use case because it unlocks a lot of other uh, use cases. We'll uh, talk about that later. The second use case is about uh, product duplicates finding. So what you can see on the screen on the left part is a search result. So here, a customer entered some text, searched the result, and got three uh, free results. The first two are exactly the same product, but just uh, the product data was uploaded by two different sellers. And the, the third result is also kind of the same product, but a little variation uh, because it's not the same storage capacity. So that's not a good front to have. What you want is what you see on the right part is a unified data sheet where you can see the product and select different variation if you have some. So we will focus on this use case because um, it allows us to get a nice front and 
uh, from the engineering part because it's a lot, it's uh, very challenging and it's very different from the first one. So I'll let Sangun explain the first use case. So to remind you, the first use case is the categorization. And the main goal here is to predict the categories of the products and correct some mislabeled categories. To do that, we have developed a multimodal categorization model. And you have the architecture on the figure here. So here we have some text input, so title and description of the product, that are transformed into embedding and then passed to conversational and dense layers. On the other hand, we have the ResNet feature of product images. And then that, uh, uh, these uh, features are uh, you know, passed into dense layers. And when we take the outputs of these layers and concatenate them, we pass again to some dense layers and then the finally uh, the output layer, uh, which is a softmax layer. So this model has about 20 million parameters. And for inference time, uh, we have around 50 milliseconds per prediction with a machine such as uh, R5X large. Uh, why developing this uh, model? There were two important requirements. Uh, two important requirements. The first one was about the robustness. In fact, we wanted to make our model very stable with some missing inputs. And the second requirement was about the multilingual support, because on the marketplace you can have many different languages. To meet these requirements. Uh, we did some approaches here. So the first one is about the data augmentation with dropout to simulate some missing inputs in our training data set and to make our model stable with these missing inputs. And the second one is the use of multilingual pre-trained embeddings to understand or to support some multiple languages. And finally, we did some experimentations and we did some multitask learning. So besides on predicting uh, just on categories, we tried to predict uh, some color or size of the product uh, at the same time to robustify our model. And also, we did some hierarchical classification to understand how the model predicts through the category trees. So, with these approaches, we managed to obtain a stable, a robust model. We'll show you the performance uh, later with a demo. Uh, but uh, there is one more thing that we are really happy to have here, because when you look at the layer before the output layer, in fact, this layer corresponds to uh, product to uh, embeddings layer. So when you take uh, from the inputs to the product to make embeddings layer, you have the model that can compute product embeddings uh, for any given product. So what's about these product embeddings? Here we try to present our products with these product embeddings with a uh, UMAP that reduces uh, some uh, dimensionality. And as you can see on the figure, we found that there are some products from the same category forming some clusters. So this was really interesting. And we also observed that sometimes it was a trickle because when the products come from the categories that are very ambiguous, like close and similar, it was really difficult to you know, have two distinct uh, clusters. So such as the you know, shoes for men or shoes for kids, because when you don't have uh, the description on title, it's really difficult to dist distinguish them uh, with just an image. But on Novara, uh, we noticed that uh, this product of Vec was uh, very coherent. And we managed to use these product of Vec embeddings for other use cases on catalog data. The first Use cases, uh, first use case was about the categorization on very small catalogs. In fact, when you take, uh, you, you, you know, you compute your product vec with, with in-house uh, data sets and just add some top layers and predict uh, on small catalog, you have your categorization model 
without building from scratch. So this was really a huge win for us. And we also managed to detect some similar products with these product to, em to, product to vague embeddings. We also managed to compute some category embeddings by calculating the centralized uh, product embeddings from the same categories. And finally, we also used these embeddings to predict some visual attributes such as the color or the size of the products. So the use of the, uh, these embeddings as an input for machine learning catalog models was really interesting and proficient for us. Now let's move to some engineering considerations of the categorization model. Here we have the training pipeline of the categorization model. So we have some Tableau data and text that are unloaded from Amazon Redshift to S3 bucket. And on the other hand, we have the product images and their corresponding resident features that are computed by an asynchronous job and stored into Data Lake. Once we have this data, we can pre-process -pre this data with Spark and train our model with TensorFlow. And then once the model is trained, we try to log it into MLLog, MFlow uh, model registry. All these things was uh, orchestrated by Apache Airflow and executed by uh, Databricks clusters. So this is a training pipeline. And the first challenge was about pre-processing. As mentioned earlier, we had a large source of data. So for the training data set creation and pre-processing, uh, we needed to pay attention for you know, distributed computation on multiple clusters, so with Spark. But also, we needed to avoid some the exceeds of memory capacity of the machines. So to do that, we used TF recalls that save text and images as binary files, and you can create a data set uh, that is composed of multiple files uh, dispatched into different machines. And it allowed us to fetch our data without having to load everything in memory. And here is the snippet of code uh, where we used uh, TF records to, you know, to create our data set. As you can see, there are just some high level functions, very easy to use, and this was really helpful for us. There are some other challenges, and it was about more model training. So sometimes you want to accelerate your training process so you can use some multi-GPU. So for example, we use the mirror strategy from TensorFlow, which is really easy to use, and this was also really helpful. And finally, it was about the continuation. In fact, when you finish to train your model, you always need to prepare for inference. So to do that, we converted our model to NX format. So why? Because Onyx format is an open standard format that defines a common set of operators, and it can represent your deep learning models in a wide variety of frameworks, such as PyTorch or TensorFlow. And with Onyx format, you can use Onyx runtime that provides tools to optimize your computational graph. So with Onyx runtime, we applied the dynamic quantization to our, on our model to reduce the latency and the model size. And we managed to make our model smaller. So we divided the model size by four. And for the inference time, we managed to reduce by 60%. So this was really uh, very interesting for us because you, know, you can scale your model or your pipeline. And we also noticed that with Onyx runtime and dynam dynamic quantization, the use of huge models like transformers was possible in production without GPUs, but only CPUs. Now I want to show you a demo of our model. To do that, we prepared a dashboard with StreamNet, and here you can put uh, some text inputs or some uh, image input. 
and we choose a product of SCID, and here it is. So here, you put a description of your product, so in English, and then you have the predict predicted category on the here. The first row is skis with a score of 0 0.87. And then we add some image of the product. We become more confident. The score is higher. We have the right category of skis. And then we remove the in text input. With only image, we can still predict that it's skis with lower score, but it's still okay. And then we remove everything, and we put the description in French here. We have the right category of skis with a high score, because there are some keywords of skis in the description, so we remove them, but we are still able to predict that it's skis. So the performance is quite good, and before finishing this part of use case, uh, there are two key messages. The first one is that today Miracle can categorize automatically our products with this uh, categorization model. The second one is that we managed to obtain the cornerstone of machine learning on catalog data, which are product of embeddings. So now, now let's have a look on the second use case. How do we find duplicate products inside big catalogs? So, as you remember, in the front, we had some uh, difficulties because some products were duplicated. Uh, why is that so? So, here you see two product data sheets where uh, it's from two sellers, and one of them doesn't have a barcode. So, we cannot identify it to be a certain product. That's why we have those problems. In order to uh, tackle these problems, we tried to use the product to vec embeddings uh, that we mentioned earlier, but the problems were that uh, catalogs are very dense. We can have thousands and thousands of very similar products, even in the same category. And secondly, uh, pro uh, sellers may describe their products in very different ways, meaning the picture can be taken from different point of views, and the text can be totally different. And this means that the product and Tuvec embeddings were not robust and precise enough. Because for this use case, we are going to compare one product to every other product in the same category, so meaning maybe 10,000. So if you are not really, really precise, it's not going to work. So we had to develop a new approach. Let's have a look on this new approach. So here, what you can see is the model architecture that takes both input data from two uh, products and will predict if they refer to the same product or not. So what you can see is that, for instance, for the text inputs, uh, we compute some embeddings and then we are comparing directly those embeddings. Uh, the same for the ResNet features and the same uh, is done for the images where uh, we are comparing some low-level uh, descriptors and uh, forcing this comparison at low level. After this, we can put some dense layer and concatenate all of those results inside uh, one big uh, feature vector that is not a feature vector because it's from two product data. And at the end, we have dense, la uh, dense layers that uh, predict zero if those products are not the same and one if they are the same. So this model is really efficient and really, really precise. It's uh, almost 100% uh, precision, which is what we want, but it involves a lot of uh, other problems. So the main problem you may have seen with this approach is that you are going uh, to have to apply a deep learning model to every possible pair, so to every product, dot every product. So this means if you have millions of products in your catalogs, and even if you filter so that you compare only the products uh, from the same category to one another, you're going, you're going to have billions of comparisons. So there are a lot of challenges that we have to tackle uh, in order to do this. So let's dive into the engineering con consideration. So first, let's have a look on the pipeline. So at start, we have some tabular data uh, coming from Redshift and some 
uh, pre-processed image and text. So first of all, we are going to do every uh, candidate pair we can. So we take a category and we do, uh, we compare a product to every other product. So we have, let's say, one billion rows. That's typically the case. And we are first going to apply a filtering method that will allow us to decrease the cardinality of the pairs we need to compare. So we will explain that just after. After we have uh, done this filtering step, we have only one million pairs that we need uh, to compare. So that's a big improvement. And now we can apply a deep learning model. It's quite big, but it's feasible this time. So we're going to fetch all the text and image data and have the model inference uh, run on our Spark cluster and uh, predict everything. And once again, it's orchestrated using Apache Airflow. So let's have a look on this filtering step. So we can break this filtering step into three different steps. So the first one is we're going to compute very basic features on images, uh, namely histograms, texture, feature, aspect ratios, in order to have a feature vector for every image. Then secondly, we are going to uh, we are going to derive some features from uh, pairs of images using vectorized computing. It's really important to uh, use vectorized computing because you are going to do this a billion times if you don't use vectorized computing. But if you have a way to do some vectorized computing, you have two uh, big matrices that you are going to uh, crunch at a single time, and it's really efficient. At the, at the end of this, you have a feature a vector for a pair of image. And then you can apply a decision tree. Why a decision tree? Because it's really efficient and it's really, we are using low level feature to decrease the cardinality of the comparison we need to make. So we don't need a, a good model. We only need a very fast one. And the decision tree is very fast. For instance, we can have 1 million prediction per second. And so at the end, you, are, you have a, uh, 1 million pairs to compare. But at the start, you add, you add 1 billion. So that's a big deal. And this step uh, is really fast and cuts a lot of the, of the prediction you have to make after. Now, let's have a look on other challenges that are occurring in the Spark SQL uh, and the joints that we are making. So first of all, uh, the Spark optimization part of a pipeline is not the easiest part. A lot uh, of it resolves around uh, the Spark configuration. So you have to do it right. The first thing, uh, the first example uh, we chose to highlight was, for instance, the auto broadcast drone threshold parameter that uh, many people don't know about it, but if you have a big data frame that you want to join data from, you need to uh, set it to false or things like that. And there are a lot of, uh, of, uh, of optimization to make. So that's a, that's a way to, uh, to start. And another thing is the partitioning of files and the persisting of it. It's really important to keep in mind what data do you have at each time in every data frame and how it's, um, it's partitioned because it will be a game changer in your computing. But hopefully, we have some nice features uh, on Databricks. And it's, it was announced this morning. It, will, it is going to be open source, so that's really great. Uh, such as z-ordering that allows you to uh, speed up the computation. And uh, the last consideration is when you use user-defined functions. So where, when you have a user-defined function that uh, use, uh, let's say, a non-serializable -serial uh, model, uh, it's really complicated to use this, because if you do it uh, the bad way, you're going to have to load the model every time you call the user-defined function. So that's not a way to, to do it. You can use, uh, we put an example of code that what you can use. For instance, the singleton class that allows you to define uh, your model so that it's uh, only loaded once on every Spark worker. So that's really a game changer. And then it only uh, computes uh, the predict part on every batch. And last of all, 
uh, you have to, uh, to take a big care of uh, memory leaks because uh, it can uh, cause ooms very soon. So uh, I'll let uh, Sangun finish. Yes, thank you, Arthur. So to conclude, you know, we wanted to share with you some key takeaways. So the first one is that multimodal product embeddings are the cornerstone of machine learning on catalog data. Because, you know, instead of, uh, you know, building your catalog models um, from scratch, you can use these embeddings to build efficiently your pipeline and your models. And the second one is that uh, before using brute forces, uh, check always about some pragmatic and frugal solutions uh, that can resolve your quadratic complexity problems or any other problems. It's not because you have the big machines that can crunch your data that is the best way to go. Um, a simple solution can ease your work tremendously. The final is, uh, key takeaway is about the optimization on Spark and the uh, inference time reduction with Onyx runtime because they are paramount to scale your pipeline. And you know, when having, uh, you have some pipelines that are scalable and um, uh, that can make really a big difference. So I think you should always think about this. So thank you uh, for your attention. And thank you, the Databricks, for letting us you present your work. Uh, you can raise your hand and ask it now. Uh, it's a question more related to the practical aspect, uh, sorry, the meta aspect of how do you uh, organize uh, in, in the company to, to, to arrive at this kind of architecture and arrive at the multitask paradigm that you use. For example, I imagine there are a lot of steps involved, a lot of iterations. So how did you go about that, trying and selecting the best uh, and um, justifying it to, to keep working on this probably long-term project. I can take this one. So uh, as you mentioned, yes, it's a lot of iterations. So to, to arrive at this, uh, this multimodal architecture, first we tried uh, modeling using only the text. It was quite success successful, but we uh, quite uh, rapidly arrived at the conclusion that it was not enough because some of the key information is in the product. And when you are browsing through uh, catalogs and through uh, marketplace uh, products, you can see that not everything that is said in the image is replicated in the text. For instance, the color, a lot of per person are not going to put it in the text. It's only in the image. So yeah, that was a really iterative step. And at each time, it's OK. We miss this part of information in our product embedding. How can we get it? And uh, it's mainly that. Yeah. Um, I have a question about embeddings. Uh, so in the diagram that you showed uh, on how to create the product to WEC embedding, I, I see that there is another layer of embedding that was created from input text. Um, I had a question on how that embedding was created. Like, Did you use word to WEC, or, or was it part of the model? Yeah, so um, in both the model, the embedding part uh, was done using uh, some models, like uh, we used uh, some, um, some uh, simple embedding layers, but also we used some uh, transformers uh, to, uh, to compute some embedding. So uh, yeah, that's it. And for the categorization model, the really important part is that uh, for the multilingual uh, part of it, well, the, the, to make it multilingual, we started from pre-computed embeddings. And that's really a, a big difference because for some languages, we didn't have that many data. So start, not starting from scratch and using pre-trained uh, multilingual embedding was really a, a, big, uh, a big part of uh, our design system. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to add something, uh, some more information. So you know, the, so this was really important thing to you know to use the use of the 
uh, pre-trained pre uh, multilingual uh, models uh, such as uh, you know Mbert or, or Crosslanger XLM and Roberta models because it's really uh, now we have the library such as transformers from Hugging Face, which, which are really easy to use. And uh, with these um, with these tools, we managed to you know um, deal with some um, multiple languages, different languages. So, yeah. Uh, sorry, Harris. Uh, I just have one question for the categorization model. Okay. So I think that that model is pretty obvious. In the end, is a classification model. So I, I remember you showing you have multiple um, categories, I think more than several hundred thousand, right? So in the end, that the classification model will be you try to predict this thing belong to one classes out of multiple hundred thousand. I think that will be a pretty uh, hard and complicated model to try to predict that many classes. Do, do, do you guys do something specially to deal with this kind of like, pro like classification problem? For example, you do some loss function optimization or some other stuff? I'm uh, just curious on that, thank you. Um, I think to robustify, you know, your model when you have really a lot of classes to predict, uh, I think there are a lot of things to do about the data. So you don't just take your the data that you have, but you you can always, you know, um, go to search about in-house data uh, and also scrap some data about the um, you know pro open source product data sets, something like that, and to you know to to go for a trend, yeah. You can you also ask something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. That's good. okay. Sounds good. So thanks, Arthur and uh, Samgun, uh, for presenting the session. So if you have any more queries, uh, you can come and meet the presenters on the side of the stage. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.